started paying a lot of attention. I, I'd grown up, I, I, I liked Nine Inch Nails, and I was like, oh, it would be kind of cool to do a nail song on the record. Nah. And I started listening to, to that record, and I, and I was listening to that song. And again, once in a while, you just sort of come back to something, and it hits you in a different direction. And I started reading about why Trent Reznor had written Head Like a Hole, and he started writing the song in 1987 tail end of, a, of a, 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 a period of immense expanse of wealth in the United States of America for a very small populace of people. A period that was the, uh, of, uh, the expanse of wealth that happened at the exact same time as, as <laughs> rates in poverty among the urban poor doubled and in places tripled. And he read those same storylines at the same time as he was paying attention to what was going on in the religious community where there were these religious figures who were asking for enormous sums of money from their people so that they could build buildings and they could, or locking themselves in towers and saying, if you don't give me $2 million, God's going to take my life. And Trent started putting two and two together, that if this is the kind of world God runs and if that's the kind of business God has, then this marriage of religious, political, and financial power it is big, big trouble. And it struck me, like I said, that if you read through the first four chapters of the book of Amos, it's exactly what Amos is writing about. That certainly there was a time of blessedness, but blessedness on the biblical scale is measured in all honesty, uh, by whether or not the poor are blessed. We can be a blessed people, but if that blessing is not passed along to those who hadn't received it at first, then that blessing wasn't treated correctly. Trent saw this. This is what he was seeing. And as a guy who wasn't a church guy, not a church guy, he was speaking into a culture that needed to hear that message, and maybe people couldn't hear it through the anger. He's a very angry guy at times. But my question ended up being that. Who, who had the courage? Was there anyone who had the courage in Trent's life to go and stand near that, that eunuch's chariot? I don't know if you know that about Trent. He's a eunuch. It's fascinating. Um, that's probably not true. But, but please post that on Facebook because I'd, and that I said it because I'd like to get a phone call from Trent. Um, really, whatever it takes. Uh, big fan. But what would it have been like? And what would be the scenario? Someone would sit down with Trent Reznor and say the things you're saying about culture, the things the Old Testament prophets spoke of, and that your music, despite maybe your best efforts to avoid doing so, in some way really reflects the heart of God. It would have shaken dude up. I'll tell you. <laughs> like, like, what? Sorry, man. Maybe you don't really have a choice in the matter. And it's an important message, the one he was preaching. Um, we, uh, it resonates with, with my heart in this way. We were in, um, we were in Guay Guayaquil, I'm going to say that right, Guayaquil, Ecuador. And um, my wife and I were on a, a trip with Compassion International. And... Uh, while we, you know, for me, while I'd seen poverty in the United States, it wasn't until I got out of the country that, like, the extremity of things really actually shook me to kind of a deeper understanding. Part of what Trent is pointing out is that there's a storyline that doesn't get told. He's trying to, he, without maybe knowing it, he's trying to tell the storyline or speak on behalf of those who get left behind by a system, a religious system, political system, financial system, otherwise. So we were in Ecuador, and uh, Trent and I, no, it was Amy and I, and... Um, And we, uh, in, in Guayaquil, uh, a few years before uh, Compassion arrived there, had, Guayaquil as a city had dealt with their poverty issue the way that most, not most, but a lot of major cities deal with their poverty, which is to say get out. And so they would remove the poor from the downtown area um, to make it easier to sh shop was actually what the government had said. Solid move. Um, and the poor, 
thousands upon thousands of them had moved to the outskirts of town and then were pushed further and further out. In order to get to the village we were visiting, we left downtown, took a bus ride, about two and a half hour drive to the edge of this dirt road, about a mile and a half hike in, uh, and then like a 20 minute like hill hike into the village. They tried to build in a place they wouldn't be found. We sat down in, in, a, uh, in a hut with a, with a girl who at the time when we sat down with her was 18 years old. And she told us a story of uh, the first child she gave birth to when she was 15. She and her husband uh, had recently arrived in the village uh, and he had to go somewhere to find work. He was gone for about two weeks. And uh, she woke up in the middle of the night knowing it was time to give birth. Women know these things instinctually, uh, or so I'm told. And uh, <clears throat> middle of the night, she hikes down the hill to the dirt road, the mile and a half to the edge of the road where the bus runs. But because it's in the middle of the night, the bus is not running. And so she waits. And she waits. She waits. And about dawn, uh, the bus shows up. She hops on the bus, and it's a two and a half hour bus ride in labor to downtown Guayaquil. She gets dropped off a couple blocks from where the clinic is that she had heard about and never been to, but there was a clinic that someone had put in while there were a lot of poor people living there to, so that the poor would have a place to seek medical care. But since Guayaquil had dealt with their poverty issue, they no longer fully funded the clinic. And so she, when she arrived, there was nobody there. And so she waited and she waited and she waited and somewhere towards late morning, a uh, volunteer staff person showed up at the clinic and admitted her. And she, at that time, was having severe complications. She gave birth via C-section to a healthy, beautiful little girl. And then a few hours later, not that night, but a few hours later, she was told, I'm very sorry but we have to close the clinic at night and you can't stay here. And she was handed her child and she walked the blocks to the bus stop. She got on the bus. She rode the two and a half hours to the edge of the road. She walked a mile and a half to the edge of the village and what was for us a 20 minute hike, I can't imagine what it would have been like for a woman who had just given birth via C-section, 15 year old girl. My wife, when we gave birth, it was a C-section. It was within the best medical hands in the world. It was a trying, difficult time. The first two weeks of being home were tough. I can't imagine this. And I tell you this story, this part of her story, not because it's this sad story and we need to be moved to sadness. This is not part of the deal. I tell you the story because it, it, really, it connects with this part in us that is just simply common to us as people. We know this is wrong. Amen? It's more, it's more than just sad. Can, can, I mean, we know that it's sad. It is sad. But it's not just sad like a movie is sad. It's frustrating and angering and it should not be. It simply should not be. This is the place I would love for us to move to culturally from the standpoint of communication, that our acts of justice, that our acts of compassion wouldn't simply be born out of places where we are emotionally moved, but we would recognize that we are emotionally moved because at the core of us has been planted the seed of understanding what the heart of God is for his people. She is beloved of the Father. Amen? She is beloved of the Father. But the system in which she lives has said that because she doesn't earn enough, because her husband doesn't earn enough, because they're an obstacle to commerce in their town, she is worth less. And so at a time that should be a great celebration, she experienced the loneliest time of her life. There's a picture of her here. Um, she's 18 in this picture. And, and the woman standing next to her is a compassion volunteer. And she was there when we got there. And, uh, and this girl, girl was telling us about the birth of her second child, a little boy, born surrounded by help, surrounded by family, surrounded by new family, this church that has trained, again, everything compassion does happens through the local church body. And this, this woman is sent by this local church three times a week from five hours away to sit down with this young girl and about 10 other mothers just like her to teach them how to be moms. 
So it's called the Child Survival Project. They, they, they train and teach and, and, and love on pregnant moms and moms with kids up to age three on just simply how to be moms, how to prepare for birth, how to breastfeed. Because you don't know. The things that we normally take for granted. And they don't do this because they just are trying to fix something. It's this. They know that it's just not the way the world was intended to work. They just know this. In the same way that Trent, or Trent Reznor looked at the world and said, this is wrong. It's wrong that thousands and thousands of people simply get left behind because they were born in the wrong part of town. Just like this girl doesn't give birth in celebration because she was wrong, born in the wrong country. This is something that is common to all of us as people. And I, and I really do believe this, that we should do our acts of service and act of justice, yes, because... <laughs> Yes, because you know, these things need to be done, but also because there is something in the declaration, the active declaration of the kingdom of God, that this is the way the world should look, that calls on the hearts of all people, believer and non, to say, yes, that's the world I want to belong to as well. I want to belong in a world where kids don't give birth alone. And so this is part of why I do compassion. And I'm, I'm going to turn a corner here, and uh, you're still with me? You're here? You good? You're present? But this is the other part of it. I think this is why it, there's an emotional tie to these stories for us, at least for me, and, and I'm projecting my life onto you right now, so it is true of you. Uh, why works of justice and mercy are important for us. They're important for us because we need to know that we're worth something as well. My wife and I, we sponsor five kids, and we do so because I need these stories in my life. Uh, I need to be reminded of the goodness of God and that he's chosen to be my father. And I need this consistently as a pattern because I'm up against a culture that has told me quite otherwise. 